Good afternoon, this is Arne Fuchs from the Kemenate in La Vreugne. And uh, I had an idea for a video because of something I saw on the internet the other day. And that was a video by Matt Easton about the weights of swords and various weapons. And it's actually a very nice video. And he says some interesting things, he mostly compares general weights and he makes all the appropriate caveats about that it's not just about general weight. And uh, as a swordsman would, of course. And he makes a few specific mentions of swords that are for specific purposes, obviously. And that is very interesting because he mentions swords for cavalry use. First, the Brazil not pommeled sword for the, 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 yeah, the nomadic knight and say Hastings. That is a very cut centric sword and is heavier and perhaps a bit longer than it would otherwise have been. And later he mentions specific swords for cavalry use as opposed to for infantry use. And especially of course in the later period we have a little bit more data to distinguish between cavalry swords and infantry swords, obviously. So he just kind of casually mentions this and he's absolutely right to do so, that a cavalry sword tends to be more they have more length and it has more blade presence. It tends to be heavier in the blade. Also usually overall heavier, but not necessarily. So it's mostly there's more, yeah, I like to say blade presence. So they tend to be a bit more cutty, or are they? Well, and of course, if you see also Matt Easton's various other videos where he explains that not all cavalry swords are particularly cut centric. However, there's this assumption that you need a different sword for a cavalry use because the correlation is made later on very clearly. So yeah, it's kind of well known, but, but, but why? Why do we so readily accept this notion? It, it's absolutely right, by the way. It is absolutely right. You need a generally longer sword and a more blade present sword for cavalry use. Now I wanted to just kind of think about that a little bit for a moment. Well, because you can have a cut-centric long and heavy sword or a thrust-centric long and heavy sword. And both those categories are more emphasized by cavalry than by infantry in general. So, for instance, the heavy cavalry is used to having thrust-centric swords, but they're quite long and they're quite heavy. The light cavalry, especially when we're talking about Napoleonics, for instance, tend to have more curved sabers, they tend to be slightly lighter, although not insignificant, but they're more cut-centric. And still, they're more blade-heavy than the infantry versions or the naval versions and so forth. Now, one of the things that's mentioned is that you have a lot of power. So, what you might have if you have more blade presence, more mass towards the tip, is that you might have more power in your strike. So for how much I try my darndest to hit hard, it is easier to hit harder with it. And then there's various other factors that come to into it, like the curved sword and so forth. But this goes at the expense of nimbleness. I also increase my range by having a longer blade, which then of course takes a bit of the weight with it. And this all again goes at the expense of nimbleness. So how easy I can redirect my weapon. So why would you want to do that? Well, it could be because you're hitting different targets. So if you think about what is different from cavalry to infantry, well, most of the time everybody needs to be able to fight everybody else or other types of troops. But there might be an emphasis of what you might specialize to fight. So in cavalry sense, this quite often is other cavalry, for instance. So perhaps they need a more powerful sword in order to defeat a more protected target, perhaps. Well, that to some degree is something that they have to deal with. But if you just think about cutting potential or striking potential, well, if you look at earlier periods when we're talking about knights and armor, well, that armor is quite well known to be quite resistant to cuts. And in the 15th century, we have fighting treatises who says that it's stupid to hit with your edge of your sword on a fully armored 
plate armour opponent. Now, funnily enough, in some of those treatises, you do see cuts being thrown at armoured opponents on horseback in particular. It is shown that people do attempt it and how to deal with that eventuality. So it's not as absolute as you might assume when you start studying armoured combat. But it definitely, if you try it, you can smack somebody with a sword pretty darn hard without really doing much if they're in proper full plate armour. But if we go a little bit earlier, maybe um, 13th century or before, when people have fairly serious helmets, but not necessarily much more than mail on their body. Well, they have a major shield, but of course we presuming you hit them behind their weaponry, their, their sword, their shield, their spear, whatever they might try to parry your blow with. Then they have mail. Although the earlier mail generally is of heavier construction than the later mail that is worn in conjunction with full plate armour. And that is still pretty good at protecting you, especially from your limbs being lobbed off, um, your chest cavity being pierced by a strike. It is perhaps less resistant against thrusts, but heavily made mail is still quite resistant against thrusts. So you do see that there is still a lot of protection. Now making the sword somewhat more powerful is not going to suddenly bring you over the edge for this kind of protection, where all of a sudden you're going to get through whereas you wouldn't before. It's all about hitting the nooks and crannies of the, of the armour, perhaps the unprotected face or the open visor or the vision slit. is still very much the a recommended um, tactic. And also heavier weapons are used, like lances or warhammers, or perhaps poleaxes on foot, in order to defeat the armour. But using a slightly heavier sword is not suddenly going to mean that you're going to reliably defeat the armour. Yeah, you might use a slightly stiffer sword, which makes it easier to thrust and thereby hit targets that are not so much protected. And it makes it easier to lever your opponent into the opportunity to do so because it's a stiffer sword. Yes, that matters. So stiff swords might be interesting to somebody who might be fighting armoured opponents. But then cavalry doesn't always fight armoured opponents. Cavalry loses a lot of its armouredness over time. And we still see this distinction in later periods that swords for cavalry use are generally longer and heavier and sometimes very cut-centric and very, sometimes very thrust-centric. Even though the protection that they might be facing is generally lacking a bit more. You might have a cuirassier who has a cuirass, but usually not very much on their arms, for instance. The face is relatively badly protected. If they have a helmet, it's usually a pretty rubbish helmet, and you might actually be able to cleave enough into it to do enough damage to make it worthwhile. And if they don't have a helmet, they might have a shako, which actually is quite protective in itself, even if it's made of, quite literally, sometimes cardboard, covered in leather and cloth and various decorations. The decorations on the cheek pieces can be quite protective, actually. So why would you, again, particularly have a big influence from that more powerful sword? Well, the thrusting through that kind of uniform might start getting more likely when you have a more stiff, thick blade. And that, of course, then makes it heavier, more blade heavy as a result. But then with cutting-centric swords, that's not really the object either. And we see this same trend. But that's not the reason either. Also, they might be um, chasing fleeing infantry or managing to flank an artillery position and they need to wield their weapons in much the same way as anybody else. So why is there this distinction? Well, then the other obvious reason is range. A longer sword gives you more range, which is very useful, and then at the expense of that range you might need to make the sword stiffer, stronger and just heavier just because it's longer. So that already adds to its blade presence as well because there's just more metal further away from you. So it might just be a coincidental result of the desire for range. Well that has a lot to do with it I think, but it's not the whole story.
Now the other thing with power, when I generate more power in my strike, this is kind of also an odd little thing to just blanketly assume that cavalry will gravitate towards that. Why, why would cavalry in particular need a sword that aids them in power? Because they already have an aid in their power. And this is the horse itself. The horse itself gives a motion and this motion of just pure speed, for instance, already gives a lot more energy to play with, to then apply power in your strike, or the motion of the horse's movement travels through the body and can help the cavalryman strike with more impetus if they know what they're doing. So they actually have more energy to play with to begin with. And then, yes, of course, you get even more power of the edge hitting the target when then the sword is more blade present. So then you, you kind of have extra upon extra. But surely on foot they weren't going to use ineffective weapons. They have weapons that are sufficient for their use. They were not. They were not stupid of course. So why all of a sudden would a horseman need overkill? And overkill on two counts. This is rather odd. Now, the other thing that is very key to cavalry fights is that the approach to the target is very different. You might go very fast or you might not. You have a lot more of a speed gradient that you might approach your opponent with. But what is rather necessary in a mounted engagement, even against an infantry person, is commitment. It is very difficult for a cavalryman to jump into range and then back out of range and then back into range. A very common tactic in modern fencing, in sports fencing, in dueling even, in actual dueling from the beginning of the 20th century that we see in uh, early films, that just skipping in and out of range is something that is extremely difficult on horseback to the point that you can't do it consistently enough to actually use it in a sword fight. So you might enter the fight at a very specific moment of your choosing if you can help it, but once you have started doing so, getting out of the fight takes a considerably longer time and is geometrically much more complicated. So a horseman needs to commit to a continual attack run, even if they just walk at their opponent on their horse, even if they just stand there and the opponent comes to them. Backing out is relatively difficult, is usually delayed by a significant margin in fighting sense, and is very inconsistent. Even though you can even canter a horse backwards, yes it can be done, but hardly anybody would rely on it. That means that you have this cavalry mentality of l'audace, encore l'audace, et toujours l'audace. The audacity, again the audacity, and always the audacity. This sort of cavalry mindset of élan is not just something that they just willy-nilly used. It is actually quite important in order to be able to function in hand-to-hand -hand combat on a horse. Perhaps also with pistols, but that's beside the point at the moment. So this commitment matters. Now, what I'm really getting to is the reason I personally think that there is this emphasis on longer, more blade-heavy weapons for cavalry use for such a consistent period of time, even though the cavalry actually changes quite a bit, and warfare definitely does, is that there is a bunch of necessities for horsemen in particular that favor longer, more blade-present swords and other weapons, even though they might choose very disparate weapons indeed, for instance a thrust-centric sword or a cut-centric sword. And this has to do with defense. In order to commit to this attack that I mentioned before, I need to make sure that I have as good a chance as possible of defending myself, of closing the line as I come in. In order to do this, I not, not only need to protect myself, but also my horse. We have specific mentions that the horse is fair game. For instance, Pietramonti talks about attacking the horse's fourth. 
So I might use some geometric tricks to ride sideways at my opponent to take my horse's head somewhat out of the line of fire, if you will. But I might also use dodging uh, tactics where I actually move the horse out of the way when my horse is targeted and then take the opportunity to attack the rider at the same time. If I screw it up, I trade my horse for his life and thereby my life is safe, at least for now. If I manage to do it correctly, my horse is also safe and my opponent is seriously threatened whilst I am safe throughout. So that kind of tactic is definitely done where the riding is used in such a way. However, the more blade heavy weapon makes this more effective. It is easier to project power in this complex environment of the horse going one way and your sword going another. So there, blade presence and range are both very useful. This also means that this is usually happening when the horse's head is somewhat towards my opponent. So we are already fighting sort of over our horse's heads. And as a result, the range needs to be slightly longer. But I might actually, quite literally, parry in a way that also happens to parry any threat to my horse's head. So I might parry around the horse's head with a high guard, for instance, with the point being quite far out. Now on foot, I might get away with having the blade much closer to me, which is a complex topic in itself, tactically. However, I could do so. On horseback, the horse's head is clearly in the way of making that swing with my blade, for instance. So it's bad for me, but it's also an opportunity to actually protect my horse from an eventuality, as it is to protect my equipment, like reins and bit and so forth, from attacks from my opponent's weapons. So having my blade more present and more projected ahead of me with its defensive capabilities is actually helpful. Now the other thing is that in order to have more time to work with my weapons, I might use the range. So I might extend my weapon more ahead of me in order to engage my opponent's blade earlier in order to have the time to do my technique as we pass by at a significantly higher speed than as what we would expect on foot in general. The range of speeds on horseback is very much higher, but even the low end of that range is already much higher than we hardly ever seem to see in fencing on foot, especially in competition. Even when people rush in, the actual speed that the two opponents approach each other with is usually a little slower than two horses just walking at each other. That also means that you need to actually be quite quick. And this is where the nimbleness is actually quite odd. I need to be very quick to do some of the techniques that I might apply on foot. Say a cut which goes into some sort of a thrust with say a wind or a hanging or various other phrases to describe that. Or maybe even cavaciones are very useful on horseback. Doing those things need to be done more quickly because the approach is more quick. I might also have a lot more on my mind and make the decision perhaps somewhat later because I'm also riding and there's various more chaotic things involved. The two horses might do things in specific ways as well as the two riders. So I might need to actually do things more nimbly in order to accommodate for my slight delay that I might find I have. Very slight delay. So this again, by using that range, I actually have more space and thereby more time to deal with in order to make up for this issue. The other thing is when I have my sword being more blade heavy, the rotational points are further away from me. And if I learn the techniques to turn around those points of rotation, I very much mitigate the nimbleness issue of a big, heavy, long, perhaps stiff sword. And essentially, stiff swords are also slightly easier to do this with. They have less wobble when you try to rotate them around the middle of the blade or something like that. And this allows me to work further ahead of me. And this is done on horseback um, very often. And there is some evidence for that. They describe this, but it is definitely something you start gravitating towards organically, shall we say, when you practice these things on horseback. So just a little, yeah, 
side note to some uh, a video I really liked from Mr. Easton, and uh, thank you again for your work on that. And why cavalry swords are helped by being more blade present, regardless of whether they're cutting swords or thrusting swords.